around a thousand trucks of UN assistance cross through Bab al Hawa every month, as authorized by the Security Council under Resolution 2533. One of the missiles struck a lot where trucks used for transporting humanitarian supplies were parked. 24 trucks were destroyed or damaged. The airstrikes also started a fire in a nearby NGO warehouse storing food and other humanitarian supplies. A quarter of the stocks there, amounting to aid for over 4,000 people, were destroyed. Mr. President, to put the impact of an attack like this into perspective, let me outline the extent to which people in northwest Syria depend upon cross-border aid. There are apparently some misconceptions over the scale of the UN's role. In one of your meetings earlier this year, it was suggested that the UN cross-border operation accounts for 10% of the assistance. I was recently asked about that informally, and I said I thought the number was in fact around 40%. When I reported that conversation to my staff, they said I had got the number wrong. So it's not 40%, I said. No, they said. Well, what is it then, I said. We think it's nearer 50%, they said. There are more than 4 million people in northwest Syria. We estimate, Mr. President, that more than 75% of them depend on aid to meet their basic needs. The cross-border operation reaches almost 85% of these people every month. The proportions vary depending on the type of assistance. For example, the UN provides the vast majority of emergency food assistance. Between 70 and 80% of that is delivered by the World Food Programme. The UN also, though, plays a major role in supporting others providing assistance. Many UN operations, many NGO operations, excuse me, rely, for example, on the UN for support in logistics, financing and procurement. The UN cross-border operation is one of the most heavily scrutinized and monitored aid operations in the world. That is because the people paying for it, who are mostly Western and Gulf donors, have been clear that they will only do so if they are sure the resources are not being diverted to terrorist groups. Because this program is so well monitored and scrutinized, we know aid gets to the people it's supposed to. Some people have suggested that aid must be being diverted because otherwise we would not see the kind of malnutrition we now observe. That too is wrong. The reason there's so much malnutrition is that the cross-border operation is too small to prevent it. More money and more border crossings would address that. Mr. President, people in northwest Syria know that the Security Council will shortly be deciding the future of the cross-border program. My office last week received a letter from women's groups in Idlib. It said, quote, we are 130 Syrian women, teachers, engineers, doctors, and housewives. We're all civilians who've lived a full decade in the war in all its details. As women, mothers, and those responsible for our families, we stand against stopping a cross-border resolution. We do not want our children to starve, end quote. Mr. President, we've also tried, uh, we've been continuing to try to seek agreement, as we have for more than a year, on cross-line deliveries to the Northwest. I updated the Council on that again last month. The various parties have each recently described arrangements that they could go along with, but we have yet to find an approach everyone can agree. Discussions continue. While we deliver a thousand trucks a month of aid cross border into the Northwest, we have yet to see even a single truck, just one, cross line. Let me now turn to the Northeast. Cross line humanitarian assistance to the Northeast has scaled up, but needs still surpass our ability to address them. We estimate that 1.8 million people require assistance in areas of Northeast Syria outside of the control of the government over 70% of them are considered to be in extreme need, well above the national average. Reputable aid organizations tell us that the availability and accessibility of healthcare in the Northeast is insufficient. 
few health issues are adequately addressed due to the limited functionality and capacity of healthcare facilities, the lack of adequately trained medical staff, and shortages of essential medicines. NGOs operating in the Northeast report imminent stockouts of critical medicines like insulin and cardiovascular and antibacterial medicines in multiple facilities. The UN was able to support the supply chain of medical supplies through Al Yarabia until the Security Council authorization to do that expired. Reputable organizations operating in the Northeast tell us that neither cross-line support to health facilities nor increased cross-border shipments by NGOs have since proved a sufficient replacement. Recent assessments in Deir ez Zur and Al Hasaka show that only half the pregnant women and new mothers in these camps are able to access obstetric or antenatal care. Humanitarian organizations are making all efforts to bridge gaps. The World Health Organization warns, however, that funding is a key constraint as available resources will only cover 40% of estimated health supply needs for Northeast Syria for 2021. At least nine NGO supported health facilities will close in the coming months if additional funding is not secured. Mr. President, let me finally say a few words about the assistance we're delivering across Syria in all parts of the country, notwithstanding the complexities and constraints I've described. The humanitarian operation currently reaches about 7.7 .7 million people across the country every month, a significant increase in what we were doing last year. That is a reflection of the deterioration of the situation. Tomorrow, the UN will be co-hosting the Brussels 5 conference in support of Syria and neighboring countries affected by the crisis. Humanitarian organizations coordinated by the UN are seeking an estimated $4.2 billion for the response inside Syria to reach 12.3 million people in need. Another $5.8 billion is required to support to countries hosting Syrian refugees in the region. Our ability to deliver aid and stave off an even worse situation for millions of civilians will depend on the political will and financial generosity of the international community, including the countries represented in this council. Now is not the moment to reduce humanitarian aid to Syria. We need more money, not less, if we are to avoid a further deterioration, the consequences of which could be dramatic and widespread. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Mr. Lowcock for his briefing, uh, and I now turn the floor to Ms. Henrietta Four. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I am here uh, uh, thankful to be briefing with Under Secretary Lowcock and Dr. Balur. So, Council members, this year marks an anniversary that no one wanted to see the 10th year of the Syrian crisis. Homes, hospitals, schools, and water systems destroyed an economic crisis, the worst in Syria's history, plunging 90% of the population into poverty. Humanitarian law flouted with impunity, millions internally displaced or fleeing across Syrian borders, and shocking violence that has killed or injured a verified 12,000 children and likely many more since the fighting has begun. Last week, a 10-year-old boy was killed in the al atareb area in yet another attack on a hospital. Tragedy upon tragedy for a once beautiful country rendered unrecognizable today. When I visited East Gota, a once beautiful neighborhood shelled and crumbling, and for a generation of children, they are growing up knowing nothing but war. Across Syria, nearly 90% of the children now require humanitarian assistance. 3.2 million inside of Syria and neighboring countries are out of school. They are vulnerable to violence, exploitation, early marriage, child labor, or being forced to join the fighting. The number of families reporting that their children were suffering from psychological distress has doubled in the last year. Attacks are decimating vital support systems, 
In 2019 alone, 46 attacks were recorded on water facilities, disrupting water access for families in desperate need. The constant disruption of the Aluk water station in Hasaka, which serves nearly a half a million people, is forcing civilians to rely on unsafe water, exposing them to deadly waterborne diseases. A deepening economic crisis is placing adequate nutrition out of reach for millions of families, something that Mark was speaking about. Last year saw the highest number of food insecure people in the country's history. In some areas of the Northwest, acute malnutrition is approaching the emergency threshold of 15% among displaced children in hard to reach areas and camps. While the world watches, half a million stunted children across Syria are being robbed of their full potential from a very early age. This will never be able to change for them to regrow healthy brains or healthy strong bones if they are starved in their first three to five years of life. Children cannot wait. In the Northeast, more than 37,000 children are languishing in the Al Hol and the Al Raj camps. Over 800 children are in detention centers and in prisons. In the Southeast, 11,000 people. Half children are living in the Rukban camp under worsening conditions, including a lack of food and medicine and growing concerns about the spread of COVID-19. Across Syria, nearly 48,000 COVID-19 cases have been reported. With only limited testing available, this number is likely much higher. And the war's ripple effect in Syria's neighbors, including Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, and Turkey is affecting host and refugee communities alike and straining economies and services and straining emotions, patience, and generosity. With the rest of the UN family and our partners, our teams are providing health care, like 900,000 routine vaccinations for children last year, and psychosocial support education, water, cash assistance, information on how people can stay safe during COVID-19, and equitable access to vaccines. Tomorrow's donor conference in Brussels will be a chance to renew global support in key areas. This includes education, which I will highlight as a critical need and an appeal for funding to urgently close the gap in support in the Northwest Syria, where the needs are the greatest. But beyond funding, we need the Council's help in four areas. So, Mr. President, the first is, UNICEF and our partners need regular access to Northwest Syria to provide life-saving humanitarian assistance. The 12 month renewal provided a necessary window to help people in desperate need. But the needs, as Mark has said, are multiplying. In the last year, we have seen a 20% increase in the number of people needing humanitarian assistance in the Northwest. Over 55,000 children are acutely malnourished and will face dire consequences without a continuation of access and humanitarian assistance. We cannot turn our backs on the 3.4 million people that are living there, including 1.7 million children. They are living in crowded camps or informal settlements with limited or non-existent access to electricity, healthcare, or water. This aid is the only lifeline that they have. We call on the Council to renew the resolution on cross-border assistance and to spare no effort to reach an agreement on accessing children through cross-line operations to reach Idlib, Government, and other parts of the Northwest. And Mr. President, second, all parties should immediately stop attacks on children, hospitals, schools, and other vital civilian infrastructure like water plants. Please, these systems need protection. 
And third, support UNICEF's call for a safe, voluntary, and dignified release, repatriation, and reintegration of children in the Northeast. A child is a child, no matter who or where they are, or who their parents are. They have a right to return to their community, to be protected and receive the same services as any other child. Many have witnessed and experienced extreme violence and require long-term support to recover and to restart their lives. Syrian children in Al-Hol and Al-Raj should be reintegrated into their local communities, while third country national children should be repatriated safely back to their countries of origin. And fourth, support the United Nations call for peace. Syria is disintegrating before our eyes. After 10 years, it is time to put the guns down to come to the negotiation table and to reach a lasting peace agreement. Until then, our teams are staying and delivering. We believe in a brighter future for the children of Syria and their courage inspires us every day. Like the children that I met in the Talamara school in the Southern rural Idlib during my last visit, their faces smiling and bright as they proudly showed me their work and their eyes filled with hope for the future. For millions of weary Syrian children, hope is all they have. We call on this council to not only keep their hope alive, but match it with solutions and support that they need and the lasting peace that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Four. Uh, I now give the floor to Dr. Amani Balour. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Council today. I'd especially like to thank Secretary Plankham for your invitation. My name is Anani Bello. I'm a pediatrician from Damascus, Syria. I'm here today to speak not only as a doctor, but also as a Syrian who deeply cares about my country. I worked in underground hospital for, for about six years. And uh, the last two as a manager of this hospital. The conditions in my hospital were beyond your worst imagination. A severe shortage of medical supplies and healthcare workers, a brutal siege which starved even the doctors and nurses, daily bombardments, with illegal weapons and even the use of chemical weapons, we were surrounded by suffering and death. My worst experience occurred in 2013. In the middle of the night, I arrived at the hospital where I was working and I was shocked to see the large number of patients, many of them children who were suffocating and experiencing the symptoms of exposure to chemical agents. Scores of women and children died right in front of my eyes. Overall, more than 1,500 people were killed in this heinous attack, which we now know it was sarin gas. And yet, even after this horrific crime, Attacks on hospitals continued, siege continued, chemical weapons usage continued, all with no real accountability. My first point focused on pediatric health. During six years of siege, I treated thousands of children. I watched them starving from lack of food. I saw them screaming from the sounds of warplanes and rockets. The lack of food led to malnutrition, which resulted in stunting, weak immune system, and in some cases, death. The trauma of the conflict also caused many mental health issues. A large number of children were born in al during the siege. They grow up knowing only destruction, bloodshed, and death. This led to depression, personality disorders, insomnia, and paranoia. 
Yet, despite all the struggles we faced, we tried to remain hopeful. One moment I remember is from 2013, when we heard, we the medical staff, heard that the Security Council has a meeting about Syria. We were all meeting with great, all waiting with great hope because we believe that you will help us, that you would help us, you would end the siege, you would bring food and medicine for the children. We told our children that the Security Council is holding a meeting for you. And for a brief moment, they felt hopeful. We waited and waited, meeting after meeting, for six years, and we are still waiting. Millions inside Syria now are still waiting. I'm here today, a lucky survivor who fought and continues to fight for the basic needs and rights for the women and children I created in al -Wulba. More importantly, I'm here representing their suffering and the action that must be taken to give them the basic right to life. My second point focus on attacks on medical facilities. According to BHR, there have been 598 attacks on 350 different medical facilities, resulting in death of 930 medical personnel with no accountability. My hospital was targeted by an airstrike in 2015, not long after Russia be began to increase its support to the Syrian regime. This attack killed three medical staff. They were my friends, my colleagues. Yet the criminals have never been brought to justice. Just last week, an entire hospital was targeted in countryside of Aleppo, which is operated by SAMS and received support from OCHA. It was targeted by artillery strike Five medical staff were injured, seven, were, seven civilians were killed, including two children. This hospital also had shared its coordinates with the UN. There must be an immediate investigation. Only through real accountability will these attacks finally come to end. My last point focus on humanitarian access. Cross-border assistance is a vital lifeline for the four million civilians in Northwest Syria. They need, to dis they need to distribute the COVID vaccines to all parts of Syria further shows the importance of cross-border aid. My own experience living with the cross-border cross line aid for six years is that it's a failed experiment. During my time in Al-Huba, we lacked even basic medical supplies for our patients. I treated children starving to death, sick with chronic illnesses, desperate for even basic humanitarian assistance, yet it never came. Approvals from the regime were rarely issued, and even when they were, essential items such as baby formula were often removed. I repeat, the soldier would remove the baby formula from the trucks and empty it on the ground. WHO publicly condemned this action many times, yet the practice continued. Such a cruelty is beyond comprehension. You can't allow this situation to return. Why should any of us believe that things will be different this time? Base your decision on facts, not empty promises. Renewing cross-border assistance through Babi Hawa is simply the right thing to do, and you should open also additional crossings to meet the growing needs. I'd like to end my remarks by asking the member of this council, are the lives of these women and these children worth any less than yours? Is the Syrian child's life worth less than a Vietnamese child or Chinese child or Kenyan child? Why have they been abandoned for, abandoned for so long? Do you find it acceptable for a hospital to be targeted? Not once, not twice, but nearly 600 times. If a hospital was targeted in Tunis, New Delhi, or Moscow, would you not immediately demand an investigation? 
and not rest until the, there was justice? Do you find it acceptable that in the middle of a pandemic, with the humanitarian needs growing each day, to further reduce humanitarian access, if your own countries face rising rates of malnutrition and disease, would you not increase the access to aid? I urge you to set aside your differences and to refocus your efforts at reaching a political solution, which includes essential freedoms and the human rights, to act with great urgency to address the worsening humanitarian crisis and to hold accountable those who attack medical facilities and use chemical weapons. I also urge you to move past words to concrete actions. I challenge each member of this council and each UN member state to take immediate steps to support the Syrian people. Do not urgently need food and medical supplies. Increase your financial contributions to the UN and its partners. Agree to resettle more Syrian refugees, huge numbers of whom remain in refugee camps in the region, desperate to avoid becoming a lost generation. Only through solidarity and shared humanity can we alleviate the suffering of the Syrian people and move towards justice, peace, and reconciliation. Thank you. Dr. Belor, thank you for your statement. Um, I shall now make a statement in my capacity as Secretary of State of the United States of America. Thank you, uh, Under Secretary General Lowcock, Executive Director Four, for your thorough and candid briefings and for the vital work that the United Nations is doing to deliver humanitarian aid to the people in Syria. And thank you, Dr. Belor, both for the life saving service you performed for your fellow Syrians amidst the most harrowing circumstances and for your powerful, determined efforts to bring the experiences of the Syrian people to the world and to push for their rights to be respected. This month marked the 10th anniversary of the Syrian uprising. After a decade of conflict in which the Syrian people have suffered immeasurably, the situation is as grave as ever. As we've heard, uh, an estimated 13.4 million people two in every three Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance. 60% of Syrians are at Syrian risk of going hungry. Every month, the Security Council gathers to discuss the humanitarian situation in Syria. And these massive numbers are rattled off. In the process, it's all too easy to lose sight of the fact that contained in each one of these numbers, are the lives of individual human beings. Like the Syrian mother, who recently told a reporter she was so desperate to feed her three children that she faced a choice, and I quote, I had to sell my hair or my body, end quote. She sold her hair for $55. For two days after, she wept with shame. But with that money, she bought heating oil and food and clothes for her three kids. That's one mother for one Syrian family. Now remember that 12.4 million people in Syria are food insecure, and you begin to sense the magnitude of human suffering in this conflict. You heard Dr. Belor say, waiting on the Security Council with hope. Waiting on the Security Council with hope. Look, we all sit in these chairs, we speak these words, we represent our countries, but how is it possible that we can't find in our hearts the common humanity to actually take meaningful action to do something? How is that possible? I have two young children of my own. I suspect many members of this council have young children or grandchildren. I think of my kids when I think of the Syrian children we've heard talked about today. I ask you to do the same thing. 
Think of yours, look into your hearts, and then talk to your colleagues. And despite our differences, we have to find a way to do something, to take action, to help people. That is our responsibility. And shame on us if we don't meet it. Meanwhile, the brave people who put their lives on the line to try to help the Syrian people continue to be targeted. On March 21st, the Assad regime shelled the Al Adarab Surgical Hospital in Western Aleppo, reportedly killing seven people, including, as we heard, two children, cousins, 10 and 12 years old. The attack also wounded 15 people including a doctor who had a piece of shrapnel embedded in his eye, he'll never see again. The hospital had been bombed by the regime before, in 2014, and as we heard from Dr. Lokak, had to be rebuilt underground in hopes that doing so would keep people safe if it were targeted again. Well, CAVE could not keep them safe. The hospital's coordinates had been shared, again, as we heard, with the UN-led deconfliction mechanism meaning the regime knew exactly where it was. Al-Adarab Hospital, which is now closed, had previously seen an average of 3,650 people every month. On the same day the Assad regime struck the hospital, Russian airstrikes struck near the only UN-authorized border crossing with Syria, killing a civilian, destroying humanitarian supplies, putting the most effective way of getting aid to the Syrian people at risk. While today's session is focused on the humanitarian crisis in Syria, it's important to note that the only long-term solution to this suffering is through a political settlement and permanent resolution to the conflict, as outlined in UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Together with our allies and partners, the United States continues to support UN Special Envoy Peterson's efforts toward this end. But even as we work to that solution, we can't lose sight of the urgent needs of the Syrian people that we've heard described so eloquently today. It's clear that these needs, including having enough to eat and access to essential medicine, are not going to be met by the Assad regime. So, again, the question before us is, what can the Security Council do to help the millions of Syrians whose lives hang in the balance? In the short term, we know the answer, and it's simple we must ensure Syrians get the humanitarian aid they need. At present, the most efficient and effective way to get the most aid to the most people in the Northwest and Northeast is through border crossings. Yet the Security Council has recently allowed the authorization for two border crossings to lapse. Bab al-Salam in the Northwest, which used to deliver aid to approximately 4 million Syrians. And Ali Arubia in the Northeast, which brought aid to another 1.3 million Syrians. We have a responsibility to ensure Syrians have access to life-saving assistance, no matter where they live. Given that goal, there was no good reason at the time for the Council's failure to reauthorize these two humanitarian crossings. And there is no good reason the crossings remain closed today. The crossings provided a path for delivering aid that was more economical, safer, more efficient. In their absence, delivering aid is costlier, more perilous, less efficient. It also means that when the sole remaining crossing becomes inaccessible for any reason, as happened last week when it was bombed by Russian forces, aid may be halted altogether. The reduction of border crossings also means that more UN aid convoys are forced to cross multiple lines of control negotiating access with various armed opposition groups, traveling longer distances, all of which leaves more ways aid can be slowed or stopped before it gets to the Syrian people, and more ways aid workers can themselves be targeted. Now, some may argue that reauthorizing humanitarian crossings and providing cross-border aid would in some way infringe on the sovereignty of the Syrian regime but sovereignty was never intended to ensure the right of any government to starve people, deprive them of life-saving medicine, bomb hospitals, or commit any other human rights abuse against citizens. Others on this council may argue, as they have in the past, 
that we should rely more on cross-line assistance to deliver aid to people in Syria, claiming it's more efficient. But as we've seen, relying more on cross-line assistance has resulted in less aid, not more, getting to the Syrian people. The failure to authorize border crossings is clearly not in the interest of the Syrian people. It's not what is recommended by UN experts or humanitarian experts. And it has nothing to do with the humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Secretary General Guterres has said, and I quote, intensified cross-line and cross-border aid deliveries are essential, end quote, to reach all Syrians in need. It's also not in the interest of the Syrian people to pressure Syrian refugees to return to Syria, including to regime-held areas where many fear they'll be arbitrarily detained, tortured, or even killed by Assad security forces in retaliation for fleeing. We agree with the UN that refugee returns must be voluntary, well-informed, and should ensure the safety and dignity of the people involved, or else they should not happen. The current approach is unjustified, ineffective, indefensible. It is directly resulting in the increased suffering of the Syrian people. So let me propose a different approach. Let's reauthorize both border crossings that have been closed and reauthorize the one border crossing that remains open. Let's give ourselves more pathways rather than fewer pathways to deliver food and medicine to the Syrian people. Let's commit to using whatever pathway is the safest, quickest way to reach people who are going hungry and dying for need of medicine. And let's not pressure Syrian refugees to return until they feel they can do so in safety and in dignity. Let's make the simple question that guides our decision on reauthorizing cross-border crossings and on all questions of delivering aid to people in Syria. What will do the most to reduce the suffering of Syrian children, women, and men? If we ask that question, the work before this council is simple. Reauthorize the crossings. Stop enabling the obstruction of aid and allow humanitarians and humanitarian aid unhindered access so they can reach Syrians in need wherever they are as quickly as possible. Unhindered access to Syrians is more important than ever, not only because of the growing humanitarian crisis, but also because of the threat posed by COVID-19. Every member of this council has witnessed in their own country the devastating impact of this pandemic, the lives it takes, how it ravages livelihoods and economies. Syria today provides the ideal conditions for the virus to spread. Social distancing is impossible when one is jostling for a spot in a crowded bread line. Many Syrians do not even have a reliable supply of clean water and soap to wash their hands. There's approximately one Syrian doctor for every 10,000 civilians in Syria. The hospitals that remain are still being attacked by the regime and its backers, as we saw with the Al Araf hospital. Already, doctors, nurses, health workers in Syria are getting sick and dying at alarming rates due to COVID-19. That's only going to get worse. And perhaps none in Syria are more vulnerable than the thousands who are being unjustifiably detained in the regime's inhumane prisons, many for daring to speak out against its atrocities and the 6.7 million Syrians who've been internally displaced by the ongoing conflict. Security Council takes up so many challenges that are complicated. This is not one of them. The lives of people in Syria depend on getting urgent help. We have to do everything in our power to create ways for that aid to get to them, to open pathways, not to close them, the members of this council have a job to do. Reauthorize all three border crossings for humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people. Stop taking part in or making excuses for attacks that close these pathways and stop targeting humanitarian aid workers and the Syrian civilians they're trying to help. Stop making humanitarian assistance on which millions of Syrians' lives depends a political issue. Waiting in hope for the Security Council waiting in hope for the Security Council. 
waiting in hope for the Security Council. Let's end the wait. Let's take action. Let's help people in Syria. Thank you. I now resume my function as president of the council. And I now give the floor to Her Excellency, Mazine Enrikensen Sarid, my friend and colleague, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Norway. Thank you, President, and thank you, Secretary Blinken, for convening us this morning. It's a very important meeting uh, as your successful presidency is drawing to a close. And I make this statement on behalf of the co pen holders of the humanitarian file of Syria, Ireland, and Norway. And uh, Minister Coveney and I would like to uh, thank Undersecretary General Lowcock, uh, to thank Director, uh, Executive Director Henriette for, and also Dr. Amani Balfour for your briefings today. I would also like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Bal Balour for um, your courage under very difficult circumstances over so many years, and also for sharing your very powerful story here today. This month we mark, as already many have mentioned, 10 years of conflict in Syria. A decade of loss and suffering that is almost unimaginable. The cost of the people of Syria has been staggering. This morning I spoke to uh, President Maurer of ICRC. He has just returned from Syria some few days ago. And he conveyed some sense of the hopelessness of the people facing possibly the biggest humanitarian crisis in the country to date. This council and the, and the international community have sadly failed to protect civilians from the nightmare of this terrible conflict. At the same time, we have also witnessed one of the largest humanitarian responses the world has ever seen. And tomorrow, the UN and the EU will host the fifth Brussels conference on the future of Syria. The conference will, of course, re again reaffirm on the international community's extraordinary support and solidarity with the people of Syria. However, the reality is that despite all efforts, overall humanitarian needs continue to increase and are now greater than at any previous point of this conflict. Today, over 13 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance, and that includes 5 million children who have never known anything but conflict. Violence continues to claim civilian lives in Syria, and last week, artillery, artillery shell attacks on a hospital in Atareb in Aleppo killed seven people, including, as we heard, two cousins aged 10 and 12. More than a dozen civilians were injured, including five medical staff. On the same day, there were multiple airstrikes near Bab al Hawa on the Syria Turkey border, where life saving UN cross border humanitarian deliveries take place. 24 trucks used for the transportation of humanitarian supplies were destroyed or damaged. And improvised explosive devices, including vehicle borne IEDs and also explosive remnants of war, are still causing numerous civilian casualties. We support the UN-led humanitarian deconfliction system in their efforts to strengthen this deconfliction mechanism. And we would also echo the Secretary General's statement that direct attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure, including medical units such as hospitals, are of course strictly prohibited under international humanitarian law. The fragile ceasefire that has broadly held in parts of Syria over the past few years has not provided peace for these civilians or their loved ones. There is a need for a lasting nationwide ceasefire. The accelerating deprecation of the Syrian pound continues to spur concerns over further food price increases and a subsequent further deterioration of the food security situation. Indicators across Syria show a sustained deterioration over the first two months of this year. There is now a very real prospect of hunger in parts of Syria. As the Secretary General forcefully argued earlier this month before this council, if you don't feed people, you feed conflict. 
International humanitarian law, reinforced by unanimously agreed Security Council resolutions, including Resolution 2417, prohibits parties to a conflict from depriving civilians of objects indispensable to their survival, including food, crops, livestock, and water installations. Humanitarian access must be unimpeded, and the starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is prohibited. We, as the international community, pledged to prevent a lost generation in Syria. Syrian children, however, have largely not been able to realize the right to an education and to a childhood. 2.5 million Syrian children are out of school, and their future is uncertain. Too many schools have been damaged or destroyed or used as shelter for displaced families or even for military purposes. And many children have left school to help their families survive. This is the generation who will one day be tasked with rebuilding their country. To address these needs, all strategic objectives of the humanitarian response plan must be fulfilled. Life-saving and life-sustaining humanitarian programming is essential. Humanitarian resilience activities are needed, such as transport of water and protection of water sources, and these activities must be carried out in full accordance with humanitarian principles and based solely on need. And the COVID-19 situation continues to be very unpredictable. And the anticipated first delivery of vaccines through COVAX will be a step forward in our fight to combat the pandemic. And we reiterate the Council's repeated demands that all parties allow unimpeded humanitarian access and uphold ceasefires to enable medical humanitarian teams to safely roll out COVID-19 vaccines to those who need it the most. But we're very concerned about the Secretary General's report that the parties to the conflict continue to target humanitarian and healthcare personnel and services. So we therefore also call on all parties to the conflict to respect international humanitarian law. Health workers are not a target. President, the UN and its humanitarian partners need rapid, safe, and unimpeded humanitarian access to all of Syria. As the Secretary General recently stated, as we heard uh, Under Secretary General Lokok reiterate today, greater access is needed. As long as the situation on the ground is as it is, intensified cross-line and cross-border deliveries are essential to reach everyone in need everywhere, including for the purpose of COVID-19 vaccination. And responding to the more than 3 million people in need in the northwest Syria requires continued provision of UN support through uh, the border crossing at Bab al Hawa. This cross border access is essential to reduce hunger, to ensure access to healthcare, and efforts to contain COVID 19. Without this life saving humanitarian assistance, lives will be lost. We fully support the UN's effort to put in place a cross-line support mission to northwestern Syria, and we call on all parties to facilitate this without further delay. Cross-line operations that would provide access, uh, would, sorry, provide aid across the front line in Idlib have potential to complement cross-border operations. However, in light of the overwhelming humanitarian needs, such cross-line missions cannot substitute the cross-border operations at Bab al-Hawa. There is currently no viable alternative to replace the 4,369 trucks that have crossed the border, bringing life-saving support to uh, over the past eight months. We need all modalities for humanitarian access to reach those in need. And before concluding, President, let me also add a small note in my national capacity. Tomorrow at the Brussels conference, Norway will pledge a further minimum of 1.6 billion kroner, that equals around 190 million US dollars, in support to Syria and the region this year, reaffirming our position as one of the largest donors in the international response. President, in closing, when speaking 
to partners on the ground, they have one particular message to convey. The Syrian people need a hope for a better future. For a decade, the Syrian children, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, have borne the brunt of the failure to end the conflict. They continue to experience firsthand the suffering caused by years of protracted conflict and resulting in humanitarian emergencies, compounded by impeded access for humanitarian aid. We give our full support to the UN-led efforts to find a political solutions led by Gairo Pedersen. We know that progress on the political track is the key to improving the situation on the ground. But this council must exercise its responsibility and do its utmost to bring the suffering of the Syrian people to an end. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I thank Your Excellency Ms. Erickson Sarade, and I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Simon Coveney, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defense of Ireland. Thank you, um, Secretary Blinken, and thank you for the invitation uh, to be with you this morning. Uh, your presence today as chair of our meeting and the strength and clarity of your remarks are welcome signs of the urgency which the United States attaches to alleviating the plight of Syria's long-suffering people. Let me begin by aligning myself with the co-penholder statement uh, that was delivered on behalf of Ireland and Norway by Minister Sarida. Our joint role as humanitarian co-penholders reflects a consistent support uh, to the humanitarian response in Syria uh, for what is now over a decade of conflict. Ours is a shared commitment to ensuring that humanitarian assistance continues to reach all people in need. I would like to make two brief points this morning in my national capacity. The first is to focus our attention on the devastating scale of need in Syria. I want, like others, to thank our briefers, Mark Lowcock, Henrietta Four, and in particular, uh, Dr. Uh, Amani Balor, for their stark and unsparing accounts of the terrible realities of life in Syria today, a full decade after this conflict began. We are confronted in Syria with a humanitarian crisis that continues to be truly staggering in scale and severity. We know the cold, hard facts. We hear them every month. And the situation is worsening. The Secretary, General's, the Secretary General tells us that humanitarian needs have increased by one-fifth in the last year alone. History will judge this Council so harshly for failing a full decade to protect the Syrian people from mindless war, violence, and utter misery. Women children, hospitals, schools, whole cities in rubble. And even now, we are unable to fully deliver basic humanitarian assistance to children in tents, starving without even basic needs and supports being met. Mr. President, we collectively around this table have a duty to act, even 10 years late. This council must ensure that humanitarian actors can carry out their work safely. My second point is to amplify what we have heard clearly from the Secretary General and from OCHA once again today, that in order to meet the significant humanitarian needs on the ground, intensified cross-line and cross-border border deliveries are both essential. This includes the continued provision of UN support through the border crossing in the Northwest. I visited Bab al Hawa crossing a number of weeks ago and saw firsthand the UN operation that provides a vital lifeline to over 3 million people in northwest Syria. While there, I met with Syrian and international NGOs and UN agencies working in, the nor in northwest Syria. Their firsthand accounts brought home to me again the sheer human misery and the waste of human potential that results from this conflict. I also met with the head of the United Nations monitoring mission and was very impressed by the thorough nature of the monitoring and oversight 
uh, at the transshipment hub. The ability to confirm the humanitarian nature of consignments, which of course is important, and provide thorough supervision and inspection is an essential part of the overall UN operation there. All of the evidence that we have before us tells us clearly that this council needs to renew the mandate for this crossing before it expires in July. In truth, we need more crossings, more than just one, but at an absolute minimum, we must maintain what's currently there. Ireland believes in the UN's effort to find a political solution to the conflict in Syria, and we will work to support that. Only a sustainable political solution can end conflict and bring hope and stability to a country that has been torn apart. But in the meantime, many millions of Syrians are desperate, in need of humanitarian assistance, and they are relying on us to provide the answers support. Let's not make them wait any longer. This council must not fail any more than it already has in our collective responsibility to the Syrian people. Thank you, Chair. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Kobani. Um, I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Dominic Robb, Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, and can I also thank everyone who's briefed the Council today, often in the most powerful and heartfelt terms. It's been 10 years since the protests from across Syria uh, that gathered peacefully to call for a better government and for democracy. The brutality and, frankly, the, the devastating nature of the conflict, which was then unleashed on them, has created a humanitarian catastrophe. We've seen more than half a million people killed, tens of thousands detained and tortured. More than 11 million have been displaced. It's truly barbaric on a scale uh, that is unprecedented. Ultimately, we'll need a UN-led, inclusive and sustainable political solution to end the conflict in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We're committed to supporting the United Nations diplomatic efforts to resolve the, the crisis peacefully and to support UN Special Envoy Peterson's uh, in his vital work towards securing uh, some kind of UN political track, which is the only way we'll deliver a lasting and enduring settlement to the conflict. At the same time, right now, there are uh, an estimated 30 million people in need in Syria. Lives and livelihoods continue to be lost Syrians continue to lack the most basic access to food supplies that we uh, all of us take for granted. And for the humanitarian response to keep pace with the increase in those needs, the volume and the frequency of aid being delivered via Damascus to northern Syria must be ramped up, including to those areas outside of regime control. But this alone won't be enough. The regime and the Russian Federation claim that the loss of Three border, three border crossings is not important. They claim that all humanitarian needs can be met via Damascus. And yet the overwhelming evidence and advice of experts demonstrates that that is simply not the case. Cross-border access is absolutely vital to delivering the life-saving aid that 2.4 million people need each month in northwest Syria. This council has heard repeatedly since June of 2020 that cross-line assistance via Damascus is just not delivering at the scale or the frequency that is needed to meet humanitarian needs, including basic health needs. And that's compounded by disruptions in delivery due to blocked access, bureaucracy, and as we saw just last week, military operations. Let me be clear, this is totally unacceptable and it uh, is responsible for making the humanitarian crisis even worse. Bearing in mind the context, the growing cat catastrophe that is unfolding before our eyes, the rationale for renewing the cross-border mandate in July is clearer and more vital than ever before. For the survival of many, many innocent Syrian people, UN Security Council Resolution 2533 has to be renewed. We have a shared responsibility in this council to do all in our power to help the people of Syria they must not be forgotten, 
and they really cannot be left alone to face yet another wave of brutal violence. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Rob. Uh, I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Atlan Durandi, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Migration, and Tunisians Abroad. Minister, we can't hear you. Could you check your microphone, please? Are you hearing me now? Is it okay now? Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes. I want to say that I would Anthony Blinken. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to congratulate you, Mr. Blinken, State Secretary of State, on the success of the American presidency of the Security Council this month. I commend your initiative to up the level of representation in this meeting, given the importance of the humanitarian dimension and its priority in terms of settling different crises. I'd like to thank Mr. Mark Lowcock, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, and also Ms. Henrietta, Henrietta Four, Executive Director of UNICEF for their excellent presentations on the situation in Syria. I would also like to thank Dr. Amani Balour, the representative of the Al Amal Fund. I am delighted that the donor conference for Syria uh, that started in Brussels today is taking place. Sir, the briefings that we've just heard and the data contained therein show once again that there is a deterioration of the humanitarian situation in Syria. And they show the scale of the tragedy facing the brotherly nation of Syria, and in particular, vulnerable people such as women, children, and elderly persons, and people with specific needs. This crisis that has been ongoing for a decade now has brought Syria to its knees. Millions of Syrians are threatened with a lack of food security and indeed famine because of the destruction of their economy and the devaluation of the Syrian pound. This has led to an increase in prices and this has had an impact on purchasing power. Millions of displaced persons and refugees have uh, escape this destructive machine. They found themselves, however, victims of uh, tra trafficking and other uh, crimes. An enormous amount of Syrians require immediate humanitarian aid. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated the suffering of the Syrian people, in particular as part of deteriorating health services and the unprecedented uh, increase in the price of medication the number of Syrians who need urgent aid just to stay alive has doubled. Tunisia, whilst appreciating the Herculean efforts of all specialised agencies and humanitarian agencies to alleviate the suffering of the Syrian people, whilst appreciating the efforts of states in the region hosting the Syrians. Nonetheless, it, we call upon the international community to uh, meet the growing, increasing needs of the Syrian people, and in particular to uh, deal with COVID-19. In this context, there is a need to strive to adopt a plan based on the following priorities. Firstly, undertake a comprehensive ceasefire, bringing an end to hostilities throughout the whole of Syria in response to the Secretary General's appeal and that of his special envoy as well, and pursuant to the pertinent Security Council resolutions, in particular 2532. I here would like to express our sincere concern regarding the military escalation and return of violence over recent times in the northwest of Syria and the subsequent loss of human life and massive destruction of civilian infrastructure. We would reaffirm that ongoing 
conflict will not lead to a political solution. It will neither uh, solve the humanitarian crisis rather, or, or to deal with COVID. Rather, it will lead to the return of armed groups and their reorganization, and it will make efforts to combat these groups very difficult. Secondly, there is a need to create a comprehensive system for all cross-border crossing points to guarantee humanitarian assistance arrives at those who need it in line with international humanitarian law and international human rights law. In this context, we would urge all parties to facilitate the unhindered delivery throughout all of Syria of humanitarian assistance and guarantee the safety and security of humanitarian workers and medical workers. We, to this end, welcome the positive approach taken by the Syrian government. This. Uh, regarding humanitarian aspects. In conclusion, Tunisia feels there is no other way to bring an end to the Syrian suffering and to different forms of insecurity, and there's no other way of isolating terrorist groups uh, apart from having a comprehensive uh, resolution like 2254 to meet the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people and to help them to rebuild and build their capacity and help them move towards a better future for all of Syria, Syrian children rather. This will help to shore up stability in the entire region. Thank you very much indeed. I uh, thank His Excellency Mr. Gerunde. I uh, now give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Eva Maria Lemetz, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear briefers, dear colleagues, I would like to thank briefers for their valuable insights. Also, I would like to extend gratitude to humanitarian workers on the front, line, front lines in Syria who continue to provide aid to millions of people. This month, we marked the 10th anniversary of the tragedy of the Syrian people. Unfortunately, a decade since the start of peaceful protests, the war is far from over. Estonia calls for a full nationwide ceasefire in Syria. We condemned last week's strikes of the Syrian regime and Russia in northwest of Syria, especially an attack on a hospital near Aleppo. It is a serious violation of the international humanitarian law. Despite of our attempts to provide relief to all people in need, the delivery of humanitarian aid to, to northern Syria has been greatly disrupted. Last year's videos of Russia and China to the extension of cross-border aid resulted in its significant reduction to many areas. The Syrian regime has not managed to facilitate cross-line aid. There is no reliable agreement between humanitarian organizations and the authorities for bringing much needed help to northern Syria. Estonia joins other Security Council members in calling for the renewal of cross-border aid this July. To achieve this, we extend our firm support to the penholders, Norway and Ireland. This vital assistance must continue, especially during the pandemic. Further limiting access would have catastrophic cons consequences to millions of people, including children in Syria. Mr. President, European Union restrictive measures do not impede in any way the provision of humanitarian aid in Syria, especially food and medical supplies. These sanctions target only those who have committed crimes against Syrian people. Sanctions will remain in place until a genuine political transition is firmly underway in Syria, in line with the Security Council resolutions. The European Union, together with its member states, is the largest donor of humanitarian aid to Syria and the region. Estonia has contributed financially to the humanitarian relief since the start of the crisis. And tomorrow at the fifth Brussels conference, I will pledge additional funding to alleviate the human suffering of Syrian people. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Her Excellency Ms. Lemetz, and I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Sergei Vershinin, Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation.
Distinguished President, colleagues, we would like to thank USG on Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock, and UNICEF Executive Director, Henrietta Four for the briefings they've provided. Overall, we share the concerns expressed by UN representatives and other international organizations too, as regards the humanitarian and social economic situation in Syria. Today, the vast majority of Syrians, more than 90%, are living below the poverty line. 60% of them are going, hung going hungry, and two million children do not have access to education. It is paradoxical, but true, the substantial worsening in the quality of life in Syria has been observed over the last year, when, on the ground, violence was reduced significantly. It is telling that the most dire situation is in the regions not controlled by Damascus in the northwest, north and northeast of Syria, the responsibility for which, I will recall, is borne by the de facto occupiers of the country and the local authorities. There is still a serious challenge for Syria posed by ISIS and Haït terror al-Sham terrorists who control Idlib and have also increased their activities in recent times in the area beyond the Euphrates. In line with the decisions of the international community, a, the tireless fight against them should continue. At the same time, we'd like to underscore once again that the counter-terrorism activities of the Syrian government with the support of Russian military is measured in nature and takes into account the necessary safety for civilians. Attempts to exonerate terrorists and present them as an armed opposition with the assistance and interalia of pseudo-humanitarians from, from the white helmets is unacceptable and merits condemnation. Given the worrying deterioration of the situation in Syria, staff of specialised international organisations on the ground are calling not only for increased urgent humanitarian assistance, which barely covers the most basic needs of Syrians. But they're also working on implementing, implementing projects to, for early risk reconstruction and support for the people. In response, countries of, that are the most responsible members in the international community, mainly the US and Europe, we hear assurances that Syrians will not receive anything for reconstruction until the country holds political reforms. The reactions from Washington and Brussels uh, to the UN Secretary General's appeal for a weakening and lifting of unilateral sanctions against the backdrop of the coronavirus pandemic it led to the opposite, to an unprecedented tightening of unlawful restrictions adopted in circumvention of the UN Security Council, including in June 2020, the infamous Caesar Act. Unfortunately, today the statement from the distinguished representative of the US and from other Western colleagues spoke a lot, apart from about sanctions of the US and the EU, and about the dramatically negative impact on Syrians themselves. So, on the humanitarian exemptions, given the total deficit in Syria of bread, of fuel, spare parts, medication and medical equipment, which affects not only normal Syrians, but also specialised agencies of the UN and NGOs, we don't even need to mention this. At the same time, we are still receiving information that American convoys carry oil and grain out of Syria into Iraq every day. On the 23rd of March alone, according to information that received, 300 oil trucks crossed the Syrian-Iraq um, border and more than 200 lorries with grain have done so since the start of the month. It's clear that while Syrians are suffering from a, from a severe lack of goods, including bread and oil, there's a tide of contraband Syrian natural resources leaving the US controlled uh, area beyond the Euphrates and in parallel there is a economic suffocation of the country as a result of unilateral you know, sanctions which is a form of collective punishment or whatever. And here now we're at three and a half months until Security Rights Council Resolution 2533 on the cross-border mechanism for humanitarian assistance expires. Only now are we starting active discussions on how there is no alternative for this kind of scheme. It is interesting to note that we were talking about unlawful trafficking across borders. This question is never raised, but for the delivery of humanitarian assistance, we need a special resolution. It's also interesting to note that the acute humanitarian problems in other countries, in Yemen, in Libya, in Venezuela, command less attention of the Security Council. So far, under, under Resolution 2355, 
as part of the cross-border mechanism, there is one crossing point in Bab al Hawa for the Idlib de-escalation zone. Since July last, when the resolution was adopted, the capacity of this border crossing was increased to record levels. And now, according to data from our UN colleagues, a thousand lorries cross every month. Despite this, humanitarian situation in the northwest of Syria continues to worsen. At the same time, in the de-escalation zone, so far it has not been possible to send a joint UN Red Cross, Red Crescent convoy across the line. And this convoy was agreed to by Damascus as far back as April 2020, so a year ago. From one briefing to the next, we hear vague explanations as about the need to receive consent from some parties in Idlib to deliver urgent humanitarian assistance. One thing is clear, that we're talking about those parties who let through similar deliveries, but through the cross-border delivery mechanism. If we bear in mind that the Idlib de-escalation zone is controlled by the Hyatt Tara al-Sham and Huras ad-Din terrorists, recognised as terrorists by the Security Council, then it becomes a lot clearer who these parties are. Moreover, those f same fighters are hindering the free uh, exit of civilians from Idlib through the specially opened humanitarian corridor with the assistance of Russian military. I'll take another example. On the 11th of March, during the distribution of humanitarian assistance in Rami, in the town of Rami, uh, fighters took food from civilians, which led to an armed conflict at, with around 10 casualties. This confirms once again that help isn't getting into the hands of those who need it, but is being siphoned off by terrorists who then impose levies on humanitarian deliveries and severely repress the civilian population. In fact, these fighters are using civil civilians as hostages to receive humanitarian supplies through some obscure mechanism, due control over which the UN cannot provide because of a lack of, ac lack of access to the northwest of Syria. A similar situation happened with those in the Rukbank camp in the US-occupied 55-kilometer zone around At-Tanf in South Syria. There, according to Washington's strange logic, assistance should be provided from Damascus, but not across the border with Iraq, which is the most direct and swift route. This is used to, prov to supply the American base. Again, we have the European Conference in Brussels on humanitarian assistance to Syrians. The organizations traditionally invite the government of Syria, members of the UN, to discuss how can you possible how can you possibly discuss this without representatives of the government? And we have UN representatives in Damascus who are doing all they can to support international humanitarian action. Overall, we can see a blatant politicisation of humanitarian issues, discrimination against Damascus-controlled regions from point of view of providing humanitarian assistance, and a refusal to provide assistance to restoration and recovery and return of refugees, a tightening of sanctions against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, and an urge to preserve this cross-border mechanism, which violates the norms of international humanitarian law and the guiding principles as contained in Resolution 46-182 of the UN General Assembly. They're doing this with one goal in mind, to undermine the sovereignty and territorial, territorial integrity of Syria, Syria uh, for political motivations, because they simply do not like the government of the country. In this connection, we, are, we regret, uh, and this is a source of condemnation, that there are ongoing violations by a whole host of Western countries of the spirit and letter of Resolution 2254. Starting from the second paragraph, which refers to the strong commitment to the sovereignty in independence, unity and territorial integrity of the Syrian Arab Republic and also the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. Thank you for your attention. I thank His Excellency Mr. Rufina. thank His Excellency Mr. Rufina. And I uh, now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank USG Lockhart and Executive Director Ford for their briefings. I have also listened carefully to the statement by the representative of the civil society. Ten years of protracted conflict in Syria have brought untold suffering to the country and its people. Many issues in the current situation in the country warrant deep reflections. 
facts have proved time and again that the respect for national sovereignty and territorial integrity is an international norm that must be upheld. Political solution is the only viable way to address hot spot issues. Supporting the path of development chosen by people of the world that suits their conditions is the fundamental way. Regime change is not an option, nor will it work. Unilateral sanctions can only aggravate the situation. External military interference can only cause greater disasters and serious consequences. Under the current circumstances, the international community should adopt a holistic approach integrating the political, security, economic and humanitarian aspects so as to jointly promote the early achievement of peace, security and development. Here, I wish to touch the following points. First, we must stay committed to the right direction of a political settlement and support the Syrian people in independently deciding the future of their country. China calls on all parties in Syria to cooperate with the UN mediation to jointly promote progress in the work of the Constitutional Committee. The Syrian political process sh should adhere to the Syrian-led and Syrian-owned principle. The international community should firmly support the Syrian people in exploring their path of development. The constitutional committee should remain independent and free from external interference. The Astana process and related regional countries can play a coordinating and facilitating role. We welcome the fact that relevant Arab states are positively considering serious return to the League of Arab. This is conducive to advancing the political process in Syria, which should be encouraged and supported by the international community. Second, we must fully leverage the leading role of the Syrian government so as to fundamentally improve the humanitarian situation on the ground. Given the acute pandemic and food security issues in Syria, targeted relief assistance should be provided with the focus on the humanitarian needs of women, children and other vulnerable groups. Recently, through bilateral channel, China has provided Syria with 150,000 doses of vaccines and 750 tons of rice as the first batch, and we will continue to contribute to alleviating the humanitarian crisis in Syria. China welcomes COVAX providing vaccines to the Syrian people. The Syrian government is cooperating with the UN, the NGOs and other partners in advancing the humanitarian operations and bringing large amount of medical supplies to the northeast through cross-line delivery. China registers its appreciations. The international community should support the UN in opening the humanitarian delivery route from Damascus to the northwest as soon as possible, which will gradually reduce serious reliance on a cross-border mechanism. Third, unilateral sanctions and economic blockade should be lifted to help Syria restore normal order. With the economy in distress, the prices of oil and other commodities in the countries in the country have doubled and the Syrian pound has depreciated 99% from its pre-war period. Relying on aids alone cannot solve the problems faced by Syria in its economy. Achieving economic and social recovery and development is the durable solution. China appreciates the action by the Syrian government to take up its responsibility to move ahead the agricultural reforms and promote trade cooperation. At the same time, it must be noted that unilateral coercive measures, UCM, and the lack of reconstruction assistance have become the main obstacles to serious economic recovery. The lifting of UCMs is a call for justice. 
and denying the serious harm of UCMs is nothing but self-deception. OCHA should comprehensively assess the humanitarian impact of UCM and the voice of the wider membership and also the appeal of the Secretary General and it should comprehensively assess the humanitarian impact of UCMs and submit a report to the Council. China calls on the international community to extend a helping hand to Syria in rebuilding infrastructure and safeguarding people's livelihood. Relevant assistance should follow the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence and cannot be linked to the political process. Fourth, foreign occupation must be stopped and terrorism inside Syria must be eradicated. China supports efforts by the Syrian government to safeguard its national sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity and we oppose intentions and actions that endanger Syria's national security and divide Syria's national territory. The UN Charter contain, contains clear provisions concerning the exercise of the right to defence which cannot be misinterpreted or abused nor used as an excuse for excessive force. Entrenched in Syria, terrorist groups in Syria listed by the Council can stir up chaos any moment, threatening security and stability of the country and even the entire region. The international community must remain vigilant, strengthen cooperation and resolutely combat terrorism in accordance with international law and Council resolutions. Countless facts have proven that on the question of anti-terrorism, politicization and double standards benefit no one and can cause endless harm. An early solution to the Syrian issue is the ardent hope of the Syrians and it is in the interest of regional countries and the international community at large. China wholeheartedly hopes that Syria can emerge from the gloom of war as soon as possible and restore peace and tranquility, and we will continue to play a constructive role in this respect. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China, thank you. and I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Mr. President, uh, let me begin by congratulating you on a successful stewardship of the Security Council this month. I thank Mr. Mark Lowcock, Ms. Henrietta Four, and Dr. Amani Balo for their briefings. This month marks the 10th anniversary of the grim and protracted conflict in Syria that has resulted in a colossal refugee and internal displacement dilemma and a humanitarian crisis of unimaginable proportions, affecting virtually the entire population of the country. Syria, a country that wants new peace and prosperity, is facing the biggest economic crisis with the depreciation of the value of the Syrian pound, as we've heard, by 99%, compounding the suffering of millions. As we speak, about 60% of the population is food insecure. There has been a over a 200% increase in the cost of an average food basket over the course of the last year, and this has made food unaffordable by the average family. In addition, a generation of children in Syria have been robbed of their childhoods as all they have known is conflict and violence. Besides this, many children have to support their families by looking for food instead of going to school and dreaming of a bright and hopeful future. Mr. President, the drawn out man-made humanitarian crisis in Syria, 10 years on, is simply not acceptable to Kenya, and it should not be for this council either. This council has a moral obligation to engage on and act decisively to alleviate the protracted unnecessary suffering, and to this end, I wish to underscore four points. First, it is fundamental that the delivery of principal humanitarian assistance is unimpeded and unhindered in order to reach the most people in critical need. In this regard, cross-border and cross-line assistance must be streamlined, strengthened, and operationalized 
in line with applicable commitments and international humanitarian law. Second, civilians and humanitarian workers must be protected. Humanitarian workers are targeted regularly by terrorists and armed groups, including in the camps that host the most vulnerable, the elderly, persons with disabilities, women and children. Stemming attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure, including by terrorist groups, should be prioritized to make the delivery of humanitarian aid possible. Third, it is important to begin placing emphasis on a resilience-based development response to the crisis in Syria, which includes the reconstruction of critical infrastructure, such as schools, hospitals, and building social cohesion measures. The exceptional resilience of the Syrian people has been overstretched, having had to cope with conflict for far too long. We therefore see merit for the rebuilding of this resilience through a gradual transition towards recovery and transformation. Fourth, the international community should redouble its efforts in the provision of the much-needed humanitarian support. Kenya appreciates the countries and institutions that have stood with the Syrian people through with generous support. We commend the European Union for convening its fifth international donor conference for Syria in Brussels, which starts today, and hope for its success. We also commend the ministers who have made commitments here in this meeting to add further aid and comfort to the Syrian people. Mr. President, we all know that the only sustainable solution to this crisis is a political solution to the conflict. Regrettably, this conflict has drawn a huge external interest that has impeded the political process. Divergent foreign interests must not be allowed to paralyze the hopes of the Syrian people for a conflict-free future. We urge all foreign powers including those included in this council who have a security or other interest in Syria to set aside their differences and work together to facilitate the long-term, the long-desired consensus to a political solution that is inclusive, Syrian-led, and Syrian-owned. We remain convinced that the multilateral system, and in particular the Security Council, must find ways to generate <laughs> and facilitate consensus and collaborative approaches towards peace, reconciliation, and dignity that the people of Syria have for so long deserved and longed for. Now is the time to deliver, Mr. President. We have heard, and we are new in the Council, and we have, we have come and found a Council that is divided on the matter of Syria, and we think the world's people expect multilateralism and the Security Council to deliver for the Syrian people. And we will stand by that conviction going forward. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya, and I now give the floor to the representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank USG Loco, Ms. Henrietta Four, and Dr. Amani Balor for their briefings. For a decade, the Syrian people have endured the perils of war and the resulting effect of living through one of the worst humanitarian crises the world has witnessed. The country's dire situation is further exacerbated by an amalgamation of factors, including severe socioeconomic decline, precipitating commodity shortages and food insecurity, climate-related severe weather events, and the global pandemic. The provision of timely, safe, sustained, and unimpeded humanitarian assistance in coordination with the Syrian government and in line with the humanitarian principles, therefore, remains imperative for the sake of human dignity. The cross-border mechanism continues to perform a critical role in this regard and must be preserved and scaled up to adequately meet the steeply rising humanitarian needs across the country. Further assistance and access through the cross-line modality ought to be strengthened to complement the mechanism and fill the existing gaps. Serious COVID-19 cases have continued to rise in recent weeks. Those who reside in densely populated and overcrowded areas such as IDP camps and other informal settlements 
that lack the means to implement the necessary protective measures are especially susceptible to contracting the virus. As such, the equitable and efficient distribution of COVID-19 vaccines is an important component of the overall humanitarian response. We recognize the COVAX facility's vital role in this regard by providing the first shipment of vaccines. It is our hope that the, this rollout will begin soon to mitigate the public health and economic impact of the pandemic. The protection of civilians and objects indispensable to, to the survival of civilian population must remain a priority. Insecurity persists despite the ceasefire in the Northwest and the many appeals for an immediate nationwide cessation of hostilities. We continue to be alarmed by the indiscriminate attacks on both civilians and humanitarian actors. We firmly condemn these acts, which constitute serious violations of international human rights and international humanitarian law. And we reiterate that perpetrators must be held accountable to prevent impunity and bolster confidence in justice. Ten years of war have decimated serious critical infrastructure, obstructing the provision of health care, depriving hundreds of thousands of children of their right to education, and displacing millions, transforming them from ordinary citizens into refugees and internally displaced persons. We renew our appeal to the international community to contribute to the country's reconstruction efforts to support its long-term recovery for the benefits of the Syrian people. We strongly urge all parties to prioritize and address the deteriorating security situation and urgent health needs in displacement camps. Further, we emphasize the importance of pursuing a sustainable solution to the frequent disruptions of the water supply in the Northeast. Access to a safe and reliable supply of water and sanitation services is essential to preserve the health of the people, especially in consideration of the pandemic. Syria's humanitarian situation will only continue to worsen and stability will be hindered in the absence of a Syrian-owned and Syrian-led political process in accordance with Resolution 2254. The international community has an obligation to help Syria and its people through positive and pragmatic action. The politicization of the grave humanitarian situation must come to an end. This requires the lifting of all uni unilateral coercive measures which have deepened the socio-economic crisis and are incompatible with international law. They also imp impede the movement of humanitarian aid despite the humanitarian exemptions. Further, it requires a targeted, a targeted and collaborative approach to counter terrorism and the removal of all unauthorized foreign forces present in Syria in violation of the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. I close, Mr. President, by reiterating the commitment of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to supporting Syria and its people to emerge from the cold despair and suffering created by this protracted conflict. I thank you. I uh, thank the representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I now give the floor to the representative of Vietnam. I thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by welcoming the participation of the ministerial level representatives at today's meeting. I thank Under Secretary General Mark Locos, Ms. Harold Darfos, and Ms. Amelie Balo for their briefing. I welcome the participation of the representatives of Syria, Turkey, and Iran. Mr. President, this month marks the 10th anniversary of the conflict in Syria. Yet the untold suffering and losses of the Syrian people have not seen a possible end. Our delegation knows with great concern the extremely desperate and worsening humanitarian situation in Syria, which is aggravated by the impact of the economic hardship and the COVID-19 pandemic. It is distressing that 
each and every time the council meets on this topic, we heard about the rising number of people in need of assistance, people suffering from food insecurity, and civilian and civilian objects being attacked, and so on and so forth. Even through the past year, even though the past year had been the calmest period of the conflict, instability has continued to impact the protection and livelihood of civilians all over the country. We take note of efforts of concerned parties to maintain the ceasefire in northwest Syria. However, we know with concern over the recent flare-up, which reportedly had caused civilian casualty and destruction of civilian objects. In every crisis, children, women, and other vulnerable groups bear the blunt of hardship. Half of children in Syria are growing up without knowing the meaning of peace. They are missing out on education and other basic services. They cannot be allowed to miss out on their future. Mr. President, to cope with the current situation, it is important to maintain safe, unimpeded, and sustained humanitarian access. It is encouraging that the system continue to reach people in need across all governorates. As the need remains paramount, we urge all parties and the UN to enhance their coordination to ensure timely delivery of humanitarian relief. Parties should facilitate the delivery by swiftly granting approvals, especially in light of the medical supply shortage in the Northeast. We also call for early agreement and further cooperation with the UN in an effort to establish cross-line access into the Northwest. Regarding humanitarian response, Vietnam pays tribute to the tremendous contribution of UN agency and international partners and donors, as well as all humanitarian workers on the ground. We know various efforts to improve humanitarian response, including those within the framework of the Brussels conferences, at the same time, we would like to stress the importance of the coordinated international efforts to achieve the desired result. In light of COVID-19 pandemic, we reiterate the importance of assisting preparedness, assisting preparedness and response capacity of uh, Syria. We are delighted to see the plan for vaccination through the COVAX facility and look forward to its implementation. Our delegation also supports the appeal of the Secretary General for the waiving of sanctions that hinder humanitarian response to the pandemic. Mr. President, it goes without saying that humanitarian assistance would never be enough. We are need, what we need is an exit door, a long-term and sustained solution to the protracted crisis. Otherwise, we will be here listening to the predicament of the Syrian people over and over again. The only way to do so is through a political solution. And the only way to achieve that long-awaited political solution is through a unity of the international community and respect of international law. The Security Council in this regard is expected to, pay, to play a vital role in making the peace process viable by promoting trust and dialogue. Setting aside division and politicization, we will continue to work in this direction. To conclude, Mr. President, my delegation would like to reiterate our strong advocacy for a comprehensive and inclusive political solution led and owned by the Syrian, facilitated by the UN and in line with Resolution 2254, and in full accordance with international law. I thank you. Uh, I thank the representative of Vietnam, and I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to thank Mr. Mark Lokau, to Executive Director Four and Dr. Balor for their briefings, and you, sir, Secretary Blinken, for having convened us and for the very successful presidency of the United States during the month of March. I would also like to welcome the representations of Syria, Turkey, and Iran to this session. As we have heard, this month, 
marks one decade since the beginning of the conflict in Syria. Ten years in which suffering for the civilian population has been a constant, starting with the very high toll in loss of human life to the degree with which international organizations have indicated that it is impossible to maintain records of exact and precise numbers. The duration of this conflict is now reaching the sum total of two world wars and has seriously put in doubt the United Nations ability to maintain peace. We hereby express our most vigorous condemnation of the recent attacks in the northeast of Syria, which have impacted the cross-border operations Baba Alwa. We also condemn the attack on the Al Atareb hospital, in which six civilians lost their lives and more than a dozen people were wounded, including medical staff. Key infrastructure for the civilian population, such as medical facilities, need to be protected at all times. And attacks on these facilities are strictly prohibited. Moreover, in addition to being grave violations of international humanitarian law, they are attacks which are war crimes and cannot go unpunished. We would add our voice to those who have already conveyed this, but it is not pointless to repeat it. The violence needs to stop and we need to open more effective spaces for diplomacy. It is unavoidable for this council to comprehensively consider the humanitarian consequences of the conflict. An example of this is the need to create awareness of the impact of the conflict on the physical and mental health of people. The harsh reality is that material and human loss has also left deep-seated invisible wounds in people. A recent survey of young Syrians developed by the International Red Cross provides alarming data in this regard. 73% of young people interviewed are depressed and 54% are suffering from anxiety and other types of health mental mental health disturbances the surveyed young people also indicate that access to social and psychological support is one of their main needs if we do not take action now we will be losing an entire generation which will live always hounded by the ghosts of this war. Physical and mental health of girls and boys is particularly vulnerable to the impact of the conflict. And this is especially true for those who have been displaced due to violence and for those who have greater difficulty in having access to food or in being able to attend school. The effects on their mental health will be clearer in the long run, but it is necessary to include, starting right now, mental health services and psychosocial support in humanitarian responses. The president of the ICRC after a recent visit to the al Hol camp, estimated that it's possible that this might be the worst crisis in terms of protecting childhood that the organization has had to grapple with. And he believes it's a scandal, it's outrageous that the international community would allow this situation to continue. al Hol is an emergency which we need to prioritize and we need to seek solutions which would put the interests of boys and girls above and beyond any political considerations. 
the assistance and services needed by the Syrian people depend on humanitarian access, which is timely and unimpeded. And to that end, the border crossing of Bab al Hawa is vital in order to deliver humanitarian assistance, which is needed, including medical supplies and medicines to the northeast of Syria. Humanitarian operations of this border crossing cannot be replaced by the routes that cross lines of conflict, which is why we are in favor of renewing authorization of at least this border crossing. The shared presentations by OCHA and UNICEF today reaffirm this. It is unacceptable that humanitarian assistance be converted into one more hostage of this conflict. It's also equally important to improve the flow of humanitarian assistance. Approval times need to be cut down. Both mechanisms are vital in the current context of the pandemic and the upcoming distribution of, vaccination, of vaccines against COVID-19. Mr. President, we must act without any further delay so that millions of girls and boys, Syrian boys and girls under the age of 10, who have known no other reality than war, would have an opportunity to know what it means to live in peace. The debt to these children amounts to 10 years. How much longer will we make them wait? Thank you very much, sir. I thank the representative of Mexico, and I now give the floor to the representative of Niger. Je voudrais vous remercier, Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, I would like to congratulate you on the excellent manner in which your country has been leading the Security Council for the month of March. Mr. President, as we've heard, we've seen how alarming the situation in Syria. Now we have briefings by Mr. Lowcock and Madam Four on the humanitarian situation in Syria which should push us to further commitment in seeking solutions. The pleading of Dr. Abdelaziz invites us all to take action. Almost a decade of war has thrown the Syrians into a spiral of despair and destitution, which but worsens, and we now are facing unprecedented levels of hunger, leaving millions of people very vulnerable. This has led to food insecurity, price hikes for essential products, and socioeconomic deterioration in Syria, all of which has been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. In this context, immense humanitarian need throughout Syria, my delegation once again calls for greater cooperation between the concerned parties for the delivery which is safe, unimpeded, and impartial of humanitarian aid and assistance to all those who need it in Syria. To this end, my delegation reiterates its unwavering support for the cross-border and cross-line mechanisms, which continue to be an essential life preserver for millions of Syrians. It is imperative that these mechanisms continue to exist to respond to the vast humanitarian need in keeping with humanitarian principles. My delegation continues to be concerned by the millions of Syrians who are living in various camps and other informal establishments and who do not have the means to implement necessary protection measures against COVID, which is a daily risk for them. It is no longer time for prevarication or entrenchment in geo strategic positions. It is time to agree on what is essential and imperative in order to save innocent human lives, especially an entire generation of children who have known nothing but deprivation, a lack of access to education, and trauma for more than a decade of war. Through these children, it is the future of Syria that will be compromised if the actors in the conflict and their supporters are not able 
to come to an agreement on this crucial aspect of the crisis. We would also like to urge all parties to the conflict to find a lasting solution with regard to the Aluk water plant and to guarantee access to potable water for hundreds of thousands of people, including thousands of people displaced and living in camps. Mr. President, Nigeria is also very concerned by the ongoing hostilities in the regions of north of Syria. We urgently ask all parties to adhere to the provisions of the ceasefire and preceding agreements, including their obligations under international humanitarian law and international human rights law for the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure. We also condemn a recent wave of attacks in the northwest of Syria, which led to loss of human life and many wounded. Similarly, the presence, the continued presence of foreign armed forces contributes to the increase of tension and hostilities and needs to cease, especially with regard to foreign interference, especially in terms of support provided to armed groups. Moreover, my delegation would reiterate that the appeal for a ceasefire and the need for a collective common effort vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic must not divert us from fighting terrorism, especially since facts show that group, terrorist groups who are ignoring the Secretary General's appeal for a ceasefire are trying to benefit from this situation and leverage it to rebuild and regain ground lost, just as in my own country. By way of conclusion, as whereas the Syrian people continue to have to face this terrible humanitarian crisis, the conflict continues, and the, so does the pandemic. By way of conclusion, given the dramatic impact of economic difficulties and exacerbation of daily life for the Syrians, Nigeria believes it's important to continue with solidarity and bring humanitarian support to Syria. As Mr. Lo Mark Lococ said, Syria needs to be bolstered now more than ever with aid. And we call on support of the Secretary General's appeal to lift sanctions in this difficult period for the Syrian people which is definitely a victim of the sanctions. The upcoming report of the Secretary General under review might have an evaluation of the impact of sanctions, unilateral sanctions, directly and indirectly on the Syrian people. With the frustrations, Mr. President, and the despair, which in turn fuels violence, let us bring Syria hope again so that they can have a reconciled country in peace and justice and prosperity. This is possible. Thank you. I thank the representative of Niger and I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by welcoming Secretary of State of the United States, His Excellency Mr. Anthony Blinken, and thank him for convening this timely meeting on Syria today. I congratulate the United States on a successful presidency this month. I would also like to thank USD Mark Lowcock for his briefing on the humanitarian situation in Syria. I also thank UNICEF ED Henrietta Four and Dr. Amani Balor of Al-Amal Fund for their respective briefings. Today's meeting is yet another reminder to the Council of the grim humanitarian situation in Syria. The decade-long conflict has had a devastating effect on the people of Syria. We are deeply concerned with the alarming statistics and estimated half a million people have died, millions have been displaced, both internally and externally, the health infrastructure has collapsed, and children have been deprived of basic education. Women, children, and youth have especially been deeply impacted. The COVID-19 pandemic has further aggravated the humanitarian situation. Syria's economy has suffered multiple shocks over the past decade. The substantial depreciation of the Syrian pound, which lost more than three quarters of its value over the past year alone, has led to spiraling inflation and dwindling purchasing power of the average Syrian household. The last decade has largely been lost for the Syrians particularly for the children and youth who have not been seeing anything but violence and conflict since 2011. This suffering should certainly move the council members. 
the council needs to introspect about the cost of its actions and inactions. There is an urgent need to build consensus on the humanitarian situation and collectively work to ameliorate the sufferings of the people in Syria. We cannot afford to be unmoved. Keeping in mind the scale, severity, and complexity of the humanitarian needs, those who advocate linking humanitarian assistance to the political track should revisit the matter immediately. The politicization of the humanitarian track does not help anyone, least of all the millions of suffering Syrians. What we need immediately is an engagement that is both consistent with the Syrian independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty, as well as addresses the urgency of the humanitarian issues to alleviate the suffering of the Syrian people. At the same time, concrete steps need to be taken to address hurdles that are obstructing the functioning of both cross-border and cross-line operations, in particular, the delays in granting requisite approvals to humanitarian aid convoys. The recent flare-up of hostilities in northwest Syria on 21st March reminds us again of the serious impediments to our efforts. India strongly condemns the attack on the surgical hospital al atarab that resulted in the killing of innocent civilians. India has consistently underlined the need to protect health and humanitarian workers. We have equally underlined that we cannot allow terrorists to take any further advantage of the situation and the council should speak in one voice on terrorism. Let us not lose sight of the need to resolutely combat terrorists and terrorist groups. We welcome the hosting of the fifth Brussels Donors Conference and remain convinced that efforts towards improving the humanitarian situation in Syria will positively impact the political track as well. We need to engage on Syrian reconstruction as well. For our part, as we have mentioned earlier, India has already extended immediate medical and food assistance to Syria recently, in addition to development cooperation projects, including US dollars, 265 million in soft loans, and substantial human resource development initiatives under our technical cooperation program. Our artificial limb fitment camp of the well-known Jaipur foot of the Jaipur-based BMVSS in India, which was conducted in Damascus, benefited over 500 Syrians affected by the conflict. We had undertaken this Jaipur Foot Initiative under the rubric of India for Humanity. We certainly need humanity now, more than ever, on the crisis facing Syria. I thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I thank the representative of India. Et je donne maintenant la parole à la France. I now give France the floor, Mr. President. First of all, it is an honor seeing you preside this council, and I would like to thank the U.S. Presidency of the Security Council for March. I would also like to thank Mr. Lowcock, Henrietta Four, and Dr. Balour for their briefings. The Syrian population continues each day to pay the price for this terrible conflict. The hundreds of thousands of people have died. More than 13 million Syrians need humanitarian assistance. 90% of the population live below the poverty line. Half the population is displaced or refugees. And most Syrian children have only known war. 10 years after the start of this tragedy, the conflict is far from over. There is an urgent need to bring about an immediate cessation of hostilities under the supervision of the United Nations. And also there's a need for a humanitarian pause in line with resolutions 2532 and 2254. The strikes near the Bab al Hawa crossing point are very worrying. France extremely firmly condemned the attack against the al Atarab hospital in the northwest. We can't accept these strikes, which are attempts at intimidation. Even wars have rules. Attacking a hospital is a blatant violation of international humanitarian law and a war crime. 
the coordinates of this hospital had been conveyed to all parties as part of the deconfliction mechanism. We insist that we get to the bottom of this heinous crime. France will continue to lend its support to anti-impunity mechanisms. International humanitarian law must be strictly abided by by all, not only the protection of civilians, but also full humanitarian access. The needs are rising steadily in a context of food insecurity and the COVID-19 pandemic. The systematic blocking of aid by the regime shows that there's no option but the cross-border humanitarian mechanism. Let us be clear, Damascus will not provide the UN with sufficient authorizations and in the appropriate time frame to respond to the needs of the population in areas under its control and even less so in the areas that are not under its control. This blackmail is unacceptable. The announced opening of crossing points within the country is grossly insufficient Efficient. The delivery of cross-line aid or assistance remains, remains marginal. It can in no way be a pretext to call into question the cross-border mechanism. France is therefore determined for this mechanism to be renewed everywhere where it saves lives. This is in line with the Secretary General's call and it is crucial to enable fair access to the COVID-19 vaccine. The donor conference that is currently taking place is a key step forward. France and the EU are doing their part. Since 2011, more than 24 billion euros have been mobilized by the EU and its member states in response to this crisis. There needs to be a comprehensive political solution. Without this, the position of France and the EU on normalisation, reconstruction and sanctions will remain unchanged. A political solution also involves justice, access to assistance and the restoration of rights. Finally, politicising the question of sanctions in the context of the pandemic in order to hide the regime's responsibility doesn't fool anyone. The EU uh, sanctions are targeted. They target individuals and entities that are involved in the clampdown and which profit from the conflict. The sanctions contain strict provisions to protect the delivery of humanitarian and medical assistance. Thank you very much indeed. I thank the representative of France for his statement. And I now turn the floor back to the UK who uh, who's asked to make an additional statement. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Russian Deputy Minister Vershinin described the White Helmets as a pseudo-humanitarian organization among those which merited condemnation. Any suggestion linking the White Helmets to terrorist groups is baseless. It is disinformation by the Syrian regime and Russia seeking to undermine the White Helmets' valuable work. I wish to be clear that the UK is proud to support the White Helmets and their life-saving search and rescue activities in Syria alongside other donors. The organisation is estimated to have saved over 115,000 lives and provided essential services to more than 4 million Syrians. As we've heard from our briefers, all humanitarian actors need the unequivocal support of the Security Council to meet the needs of 13 million Syrians. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the UK for her statement. I now turn the floor over to the Syrian Arab Republic. Once again, some member states continue to use the platform of the Security Council to politicize humanitarian work in the Syrian Arab Republic 
and relevant discussions, and to promote a selective perspective of the humanitarian situation there. These country statements focused on what would serve their goals, including their feverish efforts to extend and strengthen the cross-border assistance mechanism. At the same time, they deliberately ignore the disastrous effects of the unilateral coercive measures imposed by them on the Syrian people. This makes clear that these countries do not aspire to genuine humanitarian work, but rather to achieving political goals through the misuse and exploitation of the humanitarian situation. Madam President, it would have been more useful for the delegations of those countries, particularly the United States, to seize this high-level meeting to denounce their failed policies over the past 10 years that has led Syria to this disastrous situation, would it not have been more productive for the United States to announce today the termination of its occupation of Syrian territories and to put an end to its support of separatist militias and stop the plunder of Syrian wealth? Would it not have been more productive to demand the Turkish regime to withdraw its military forces from Syrian territory and stop its support for terrorist organizations and affiliated entities? Would it not have been more productive to speak with one voice against all those who deny Syrians access to their utmost needed economic resources? The positions of some countries to which we listen today do not in any way help to improve the humanitarian situation in my country, Syria, enshrining dictations by these countries, imposing conditionality on reconstruction, ignoring all calls for the lifting of unilateral coercive measures and obstructing the return of the displaced these are all factors that do not contribute to establishing an environment conducive to a political solution and restoring security and stability to Syria. Madam President, we were hoping that Mr. Lowcock's briefing today would have been more balanced and to refer to the substantial effort made by the Syrian government to deliver humanitarian assistance. We were hoping that you would refer to the disastrous impact of unilateral coercive measures on the Syrian people and to the fact that terrorist groups supported by the Turkish occupation continue to shell cities in Aleppo, which led to the killing of two civilians and has injured a number of civilians, including children. The Syrian government reaffirms that it is the first responsible party for the needs of the Syrian people. And we reaffirm that the center of humanitarian work in Syria is Damascus and not any other city in neighboring countries or beyond. This is the simplest embodiment of the principle of the sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity of the Syrian Arab Republic, which is affirmed by all United Nations relevant resolutions. This also means there is a need to engage in constructive cooperation and effective coordination with the Syrian government to enhance humanitarian work and support the joint efforts of the Syrian government and its partners in providing humanitarian aid and delivering it to those who deserve it in order to achieve tangible qualitative improvement. 
As for the cross-border assistance mechanism, the Syrian government has repeatedly expressed its serious concerns over it, especially with regard to its violation of the principle of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria and the parameters of humanitarian work established by General Assembly Resolution 46-182. The Syrian government, and based on its concern for the needs of the Syrians and the provision of aid to Syrians on all its territories, took the initiative of strengthening cross-line assistance mechanism to improve the humanitarian situation, bearing in mind that the conditions that prevailed at the time of the adoption of Resolution 2165 in 2014 no longer exist. In this regard, I would like to briefly point out a number of grave flaws that accompanied the implementation of the cross-border assistance mechanism. One, the so-called monitoring mechanism has shown over the past years the inability of those in charge of it to guarantee verification and accuracy standards that ensure due credibility and professionalism. Unfortunately, OCHA office in the Turkish city of Gaziantep does not adhere to the work controls as mandated in the UN Charter, which leads to its exploitation as a tool to serve the agendas of some countries. Two, the distribution mechanism represents the most dangerous aspect of this process due to the lack of transparency and identification of third parties or partners that OCHA refers to in its reports. Add to that the experience of past years, which has shown the terrorist organizations such as Al Nusra Front and the Levant Liberalization Organization and the White Helmets monopolizing the largest amount of humanitarian aid that the United Nations drops at the borders and using it to finance their terrorist activities, gain loyalties, and recruit new terrorists. Three. This mechanism allowed the Turkish regime to freely sponsor terrorist organizations and to move forward with its policies aimed at changing the demographic character and imposing Turkification measures of various aspects of life in that region, including the imposition of Turkish curricula and circulation of the Turkish currency. The Syrian government is committed to delivering humanitarian aid to all Syrian regions, including cross lines, and it has opened a number of humanitarian crossings in cooperation with our Russian friends, including the one it recently opened in Sarakib. However, we condemn the terrorist groups preventing our people in Idlib from exiting through these humanitarian crossings and holding them as hostages and human shields. The Syrian government considers some countries' intentional disregard of these practices, which represent a violation of international humanitarian law as an act of support of terrorist organizations controlling Idlib. Madam President, it is reprehensible to hear the statements of some countries blaming the Syrian government for everything related to the human tragedy that its people are under undergoing. As a part of the campaign to mislead public opinion and draw its sympathy in order to convince it that these countries have nothing to do with what befell on Syria after 10 years of terrorist war against it. However, despite the extent of the disinformation campaign, they cannot convince anyone that these countries are not responsible 
for bringing thousands of foreign terrorists to Syria. What is worse is that these governments now refuse to repatriate terrorists to their countries of origin in order to be prosecuted for their crimes and to rehabilitate and reintegrate their women and children. They want those who listen to their statements today to believe that the illegitimate unilateral coercive measures imposed by these countries against the Syrian people, the most recent of which, the so-called Caesar Act, do not represent economic terrorism and a collective punishment. Secretary of State Blinken in his statement wondered about the best way to put an end to the suffering of the Syrian people. I will answer you, sir. The first step would be to lift these inhumane coercive measures imposed by your country on the Syrian people. They want us to believe that imposing conditionality on the reconstruction process does not impede the provision of an environment conducive to the voluntary and dignified return of refugees and displaced persons to their areas nor that it may cause a new refugee crisis. They want us to believe that the Brussels conference held today is a forum for assisting Syrians and support Syria's future while excluding the Syrian government. And it is used as a platform to target the Syrian government and tarnish its image. In conclusion, I stress that the discussions of the Security Council cannot achieve progress through provocative statements and the use of inappropriate and sometimes rude terms. Progress is only possible by staying away from politicization and through an open and constructive dialogue based on the mutual respect between member states, taking into account the views of the countries concerned with the discussion. I thank you. I thank the representative of Syria for his statement, and I now turn the floor to the representative of Turkey. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, thank you for convening this meeting. I also thank USG Loco and UNICEF Executive Director Ford for their insightful briefings. And I salute Dr. Amani Balur, who saved countless lives in an underground hospital in eastern Kuta. In March 2011, the Syrian regime detained and tortured demonstrators in Dara. These young people had wanted to express their desire to live in a democratic and free society. This was the beginning of Assad's horrific war against its own people. 10 years have passed. Since then, we, the international community, could not bring an end to the violence and human rights violations in Syria. The figures are appalling. More than 60% of Syria's pre-war population were forced to flee their homes. More than a half million people died. Inside Syria, over 80% of people are living in poverty. 86% of refugee children do not want to return to Syria. They feel unsafe to go back. At least two aid workers and eight medical personnel are killed every month. 56% of the Syrian people are afraid to live near health facilities because these are regularly targeted by the Assad regime and its supporters. These numbers only get worse, and the Security Council hold meetings one after another to no avail. Madam President, my country is faced with all the security implications and humanitarian consequences of the conflict in Syria. We have been hosting 4 million Syrians. We have ensured that UN cross-border humanitarian assistance reach millions of people in Syria. 
we set a red line in Idlib and protect 5 million vulnerable people from Assad and its backers. Turkey is the only NATO country that engaged in chest-to-chest -chest combat in Syria with Daesh. And we maintain our resolute fight against terrorist organization, PKKYPG, and the separatist agenda that aims to establish a totalitarian rule in Northeast Syria. Madam President, the perpetrators of mass atrocities in Syria continue to target civilians and civilian infrastructure. The barbaric attack on Atari Hospital last week, a UN deconflicted facility, is the latest example of the war crimes taking place in Syria. The perpetrators killed innocent civilians and destroyed 24 aid tracks and relief items for more than 20,000 people. We strongly condemn these violations of international humanitarian law. The perpetrators should be and will be exposed and held accountable. Madam President, today the humanitarian situation in Syria is worse than nine months ago when Resolution 2533 was adopted. As it was stated before me, 13.4 30, million people are in humanitarian need. This is a 20% increase from last year. As part of the UN cross-border assistance, over 12,000 aid trucks crossed into Northwest in 2020, including over 10,000 through Bab el Hawad. Millions of people need COVID-19 vaccines. This human-made situation can only be compared to the most terrible crimes of human history. Madam President, we all remember the heartbreaking images of Syrians from six years ago. They were fleeing for their lives. We can face another mass exodus if the UN cross-border humanitarian operation is not renewed in July. We do not have time to waste with discussions about cross-line access, which can never meet the scale of cross-border operations. It is particularly futile to advocate cross-line aid subject to regime's approval. Damascus itself tops the list in terms of humanitarian needs, with an additional half a million of its residents becoming vulnerable compared to last year. Unilateral initiatives do not have the consent of the local population, could only serve attempts to legitimize Assad's dictatorship. As USG Lowcock emphasized today, and as it was highlighted by the Secretary General on different occasions, the most scrutinized system in the world had been in place to monitor the UN operations from Bab el Hawa. The lies that we heard today about Bab el Hawa are yet another attempt to cover the most unlawful, inhuman starvation campaigns that have been conducted against Syrian people. The unanimous adoption of Resolution 2165 in 2004 14 was one of the most important signs of unity within the Council. It is time for all members of the Council to prove that they really care about the urgent needs of the innocent people of Syria and authorize renewal of the UN cross-border mechanism. Madam President, Syrian people have endured the darkest decade of our time. The current humanitarian situation is a consequent consequence of Assad's regime's fight against the legitimate demands of Syrian people, and we all know it. While we are waiting for the political process to deliver in accordance with Resolution 2254, we need to respond urgently to the deepening humanitarian situation. This is a fight between right and wrong. This is a matter of humanitarian principles, and millions of human lives are at stake. We need real action now. Madam President, as to the statement made by the Syrian regime representative, I will repeat, I do not consider him as my legitimate counterpart. His presence here is an affront to the millions of Syrians who suffered countless crimes at the hands of the regime, and therefore I will not honor his delusional remarks with a response. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Turkey for his statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran.
We can't hear you, Ambassador. Could you check your microphone, please? No, perhaps you can refresh the browser, refresh your connection, please. Ambassador, you're still not uh, uh, hearable. Scott, can you double check for us? Uh, we have heard recently from the Secretary General and other UN officials about the risk of hunger in Syria in 2021. This leaves no doubt about the necessity and urgency of mobilizing international assistance to address this critical challenge. While providing food and other humanitarian assistance to the people in need is necessary and must be pursued as a high priority, in the long run, it cannot by itself resolve the problem. However important, Providing humanitarian assistance can in no way substitute for, for, for fundamental measures that need to be taken to ensure durable peace, security, and stability in the country. The first and foremost of such acts is ensuring Syria's full sovereignty and territorial integrity through uprooting all terrorists, withdrawing uninvited foreign forces, ending the occupation, and securing its borders. Furthermore, Necessary measures must be taken for reconstruction of the country's critical infrastructure, further improving the conditions conducive for the return of all refugees and internally displaced persons, as well as stimulating further progress in the political process. We cannot overemphasize that there is no military solution to this conflict. It must be settled peacefully and in full conformity with international law. At the same time, a political solution can neither be achieved in isolation or overnight, nor must progress in that domain be considered as a precondition for making progress in other areas. Politicizing humanitarian aids and return of refugees and internally displaced persons, or imposing unilateral sanctions are hurtful, as they only prolong both the crisis and griefs of the Syrian people, who are already suffering seriously from other hardships particularly the COVID-19 pandemic. While 10 years of conflict has negatively impacted Syria's economic condition, the destructive effects of unilateral sanctions in further worsening the economic situation of the country are self-explanatory. It has now become quite obvious that certain countries have intended to achieve, through imposing san sanctions, the objectives they have failed to gain by military means or political leverage. By imposing sanctions, these countries are punishing the entire Syrian nation, adding insult to the injury of the most vulnerable segments of the country. No state shall, be, shall use economic, political, or any other type of measures, including unilateral sanctions, to coerce another state, weaponizing food and medicine, and endangering the food security of a nation are unjust and unacceptable. And the so-called humanitarian exemptions are not panaceas, as in practice they do not work within the vast and sophisticated sanctions web. As a tool for collective punishment of entire nations, unilateral sanctions are flagrant 
violations of the purposes and principles of the United Nations and, and must therefore be removed immediately. We once again call for the mobilization of international assistance to address the current humanitarian situation in Syria, while stressing that its long-term solution is to work toward ending the conflict, ensuring Syria's full sovereignty and territorial integrity, removing unilateral sanctions, and avoiding politicization of humanitarian issues, such as reconstruction and, and return of refugees and internally displaced persons. In its turn, Iran is committed to political resolution of this crisis and will continue supporting a truly Syrian-led, Syrian-owned, UN-facilitated political process, as well as assisting the people and government of Syria to restore the unity and territorial integrity of their country. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of, Iran, of the Islamic Republic of Iran for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation to make additional remarks. Thank you, President. I can't not respond to what was said by my British colleague about the white helmets. We believe that the approach taken by my Western and British colleagues to defend all humanitarian actors, including the white helmets, deserves to be better used. Despite the growing testimonies about their links to terrorists and how their films are staged. Um, we have Western accusations against Damascus. This practice continues. We on many occasions have highlighted these false films and provided the relevant material. We've held press conferences on it too. However, you prefer to not notice this because the real truth is uncomfortable for you. So what type of characters are presented as humanitarian workers from the White Helmets? We need best to look at the fact that so far, many of those who've fled abroad following the liberation of large part of the Syrian territory, despite all of their requests, their Western colleagues have not got to the bottom of it. Their ba Western backers have not got to the bottom of it. And we hear the, about their links about to terrorism and terrorists. Colleagues, we understand your efforts to justify yourselves before British taxpayers for the money spent to support the alleged Syrian opposition. We sympathize, and it must be very difficult, particularly in the light of the questions that are rising as regards who's behind the white helmets from the British Special Services, Mr. James Le Mazurier, and his death. However, all of these public issues don't need to be brought to the meetings of the Security Council. The British diplomacy did, is not covering itself in glory in doing so. Thank you for your attention. I thank the uh, representative from the uh, Russian Federation for his statement. There are no further names on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjoined.